Everybody, hey, you know, this morning I was listening to a program, and was, he was talking about worship and how we are to let ourselves go. This is for God, you know. We're not to let ourselves hang on to anything, but to give it to him. This is our time to worship him and to give all to him. So um, we're going to start out, Behold What Matter. <laughs> Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. That we should be called the sons of God. That we should be called the sons of God. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. That we should be called the sons of God. That we should be called the sons of God. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. That we should be called the sons of God. That we should be called the sons of God. That we should be called the sons of God. That we should be called the sons of God. Next time we're going to do that, we're going to, everybody's going to clap on that one. <laughs> you may be seated. Thank you. <laughs> While I was doing it, but I was going to also. <laughs> I'm forgiven. Because you were forsaken, I am accepted, you were condemned, I am alive and well, your spirit lives within me, because you died and rose again.
that you, my King, would die for me. Amazing love, I know it's true, and it's my joy to honor Oh, baby. 
Father, for being here with us, Lord. We pray, Lord, that our worship was honoring you in every way, Lord, that you'll just feel our hearts and know how much we love you, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you'll be with Pastor Rick today as he gives us the message. Let us apply it and live it and learn from it, Lord, that we might be your light as we go out into the world. I ask this all in thy precious and most loving name of Jesus. Amen. Started out this morning with that chorus, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, has given to us. Anyone know where that comes from? What passage of scripture that was found in? It was in 1 John. There you go. <laughs> See, that, that kind of proves the point that sometimes we don't always remember what the, what the preacher talks about on Sundays. We're going through 1 John, and, and, and 1 John, behold, I think it was chapter 3, verse 1. <laughs> behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. And then that second, uh, the second chorus uh, the, that we sang, you, you are my king. Because when God bestows his love upon us, when we become children of God, he is our king. We submit our, <clears throat> our lives to him. And then we say, purify my heart. At all times, we ought to be asking God to do that. God, purify my heart. I want a clean heart uh, before you, Father. Create in me a clean heart, as we, as we also sing. And... Um, it's so appropriate, uh, that, that whole worship set, Trudy. I don't know, well, I know where you got it from. I mean, I, obviously the Holy Spirit was really speaking to your heart this week. But that is so appropriate because it, it really falls right into place of what God wants us to, to hear this morning. So let me ask you this question. We're going to be looking at, at uh, 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. And we're going to be considering uh, verses 19 through 24. So here, here's a question for you. Are, are there times in your life when you just don't feel like a Christian? 
and you need some assurance. I, I believe most of us can relate to that. You know, in our study of of 1 John, we're learning what it, what it is to be a contagious Christian. Contagious is in, in the medical field is when you're contagious, that means you can spread that disease around. And, and for a person to be a contagious Christian, that means you spread your faith around. And so that's what 1 John is all about, is learning how to be a contagious Christian, how to spread your faith uh, around and and uh, the fact is we can't be contagious Christians if we don't feel like we are Christians. Our enemy, the devil, knows that, and you know what? He does everything in his power that he can to plant doubts in our minds, in order to, to cause us to be ineffective in our Christian walk, to be ineffective in our, in our witness for Him. So whenever those doubts come into our minds, there's three things that, that, uh, that John reveals in this particular passage of Scripture, three things that, that we're going to learn from John that will give us assurance that we're genuine Christians and that we can feel like that. The first assurance is this. Assurance number one, caring acts of love. Caring acts of love. <clears throat> John points out that uh, in, in every Christian's life, there are times when, when our hearts condemn us and we we just don't feel like Christians. And oftentimes, you, you know where that's coming from? It's coming from our enemy. Oftentimes that Satan is, is making false accusations against us in order to cause us to feel guilty and to, be un, and to feel that we're unusable to God. In verses 19 through the first part of, of verse 20, John writes this, and, and by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our hearts condemn us, notice that, if our hearts condemn us, John begins by saying this, and by this we know. And what he's referring to is that previous uh, section that, that we studied last week that teaches that genuine Christians cannot hate. Genuine Christians don't hold back. They, they, they express their love in, in a compassionate, caring ways. And when we have those doubts concerning our relationship with God. One way to get rid of those doubts is to remind ourselves of, of those caring acts of love that, we, that we've done. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5.8, be sober. The word means be alert. Be on guard. Be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. The word devour, in the Greek, it means to eat down. Also means to intimidate. And I, I'm sure most of you have heard this phrase before, <clears throat> man, he's going to eat your lunch. And, I, and I'm here to tell you this, that's exactly what Satan wants to do. He wants to devour you. He wants to intimidate you, to, to keep you from being a contagious Christian. So he'll, he'll, he'll project our failures, our shortcomings in our minds. He'll create situations that'll cause us to be angry 
to lose our tempers, to be unloving in our attitudes. And then what that does is that it causes us to have doubts about the sincerity of our walk with Christ and and even to have doubts about our salvation. You know, man, if I was if I was truly saved, I wouldn't I wouldn't fly off the handle like that all the time. If I was if I was truly if I was a real Christian, I wouldn't be treating my brother or my sister like that. And Satan throws those thoughts in our minds. So how do we counter? How do we counter this? Well, think of some specific acts of love that the Holy Spirit has prompted you to perform. Because remember, listen, God is a God of love. Satan is the God of hate. They're opposites. God loves you. Satan hates you. Sometimes I get down and doubt myself or doubt my calling. And and when that happens, I go back in my office. I have a file cabinet. And in in that file cabinet, one of the files, there is a a pretty thick brown manila envelope. And it's full of cards that I've received in past years from folks. I'll pull some of those cards out, and I'll sit and I'll read that. Read those. What an encouragement that is. I, I have an example of one that was uh, given to me by a young lady in India one year when I was in India. And, and it, was, it was really good because uh, I was feeling, God, am I really accomplishing anything here? Am I really, am I really doing what I should be doing here? And this is, this is what she wrote. See, over in India, they call, they call every, every one of us that go over, they call him uncle. You know, Rick uncle. And so she, she wrote this, this card, this beautiful card. It says, to Uncle Rick. And then, and then inside, very artistic young lady, she writes this. And, and, and by the way, she's, she was only about 15 or 16 years old when she wrote this. She says, thankfulness is the key to an open heart. Thankfulness, it brings a friend and a start. Being thankful is what I learned as I grew up too fast. She's only 16 years old and she grew up too fast. It changed how I viewed things, which was different from the past. Maybe thankfulness was a result of comparing that actually I have nothing to own, but through God's love itself, shown through others. You know what she said? Through God, through God's love itself, shown through others. Plentiful is shown. And, and as I read this, sometimes I get kind of emotional, but she says, therefore... I am thankful for everything I see you do. You are amazing all the time, and I am also thankful for you. And I'll pull that out, and I'll read it, and I'll say, yeah, God, you're right. And sometimes, you know, and, and I've talked to other pastors uh, from around the country, and, and uh, sometimes they get kind of down and, you know, they, some of them get what they call the Monday morning resignation blues. <laughs> they feel, I, I'm just not accomplishing what I should be. The, the folks aren't, aren't hearing the message I'm giving, or I, I'm, I'm just not effective enough and everything. And, 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 you know, but I'll tell you something. I am so blessed, and I am so fortunate 
to be the pastor of such a loving church. I mean, last week was awesome. You guys treated me so, I mean, you ran me ragged. (laughs) My daughter sat in our living room last week. uh, She was visiting over, and she looked at me. She says, and, and, you know, she wasn't here, but thanks to one of the ladies in our church that sent her a link to the video that, thanks to Brian, was posted on the internet, she says, so she says, so dad, I hear you're not into uh, uh, scavenger hunts anymore. <laughs> That's an understatement. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, it, it was awesome. And I, I want to publicly thank uh, the members of our church for being such a loving family and uh, for accepting me as I am, warts and all. One way. Yes. But sometimes I do. I get down. And when I do, I I, I go back. And, you know, you you guys did a a 10th year anniversary for me, and I still have all the cards in that little folder in my office, and I go back, and this past week I went back and read every single one of them, Every one of them. And, and so I do. I, I, I do that. It, re, it reminds me of the things I've done in ministering to others. And, and that, that gives assurance in my heart. Yeah, I'm, I'm where God wants me to be. And, and all of us need reassuring proof when, when the evil one attacks us. And when our hearts condemns us, as John says. John tells us in in, in 1 John chapter 4, the last part of verse 12, uh, the first part of verse 13, he says, if we love one another, God abides in us. And his love has been perfected in us. We know, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us. Remember what John told his disciples? He says, by by this they'll know that you're my disciples by your love for one another. By your love for one another. When our hearts condemns us in that, that we recognize that we really don't measure up to the standards of, of love and, and, and we feel insecure at times in approaching God, we need to remember, as John points out in verse 20, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Our conscience may not acknowledge those, those caring acts that we've done through the power of the Holy Spirit, but listen, God does. And John says, God's greater than our hearts. God takes everything into account, unlike our, con- uh, our conscience. He even takes into account the, the atoning work of, of Christ on the cross. You see, God is, is, is more compassionate. He is more understanding toward us than sometimes we are toward ourselves. God knows us so much better than we know ourselves. He created us. He knows everything, everything about us. And yet, The Bible says he still loves us. And God says in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 3, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with with loving kindness, I have drawn you. God's the one that draws us to him because of his love to us. Because he loves us so much, he reaches out and he draws us to himself. You know what? Even when we sin, God never condemns us. 
I, I, I think of the, the story in John chapter 8 where the scribes and the Pharisees had brought before they came to Jesus and they, they brought along a woman who was caught in the act of adultery. They, they were making accusations and condemning her. Jesus simply wrote down on the ground something. I don't know what it was. But then he said this. Let, let the one who has no sin in his life throw the first stone. And you know what happened? <clears throat> they all turned around and walked away. They left. And Jesus looked at the woman. He says, woman, where are your accusers? Is there no one who condemns you? And she says, no, Lord, no one. And then he says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. I, I really... God is faithful. Listen, God is just. And, and, and he will forgive our sins and he will cleanse us of all unrighteousness. No matter how bad the sin is, no matter how light the sin is, no matter what it is, God is, is willing and waiting for us to confess our sin and, and he'll forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And, and then, then we ought to thank God when that happens. We ought to thank God for, for what he does for us as was stated in Psalm 103, verse 12. In Psalm 103, verse 12, it says this. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. Do you know how far the east is from the west? <laughs> to infinity and beyond. You can't catch it. So whenever we f feel that we fell the Lord, we need to remember. We need to remember the stories of David, who committed adultery and murder, and 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 how about Abraham, who was a liar? Moses. How about Jacob? Jacob, who stole his brother's birthright, and Paul. Man, Paul went around killing Christians and throwing them in prison. He, he wanted to just uh, wipe out all the Christians in the world. They all fell the Lord. And oh, don't, don't forget Peter. Uh, he miserably fell the Lord by denying him. Not once, not twice, but three times he denied even knowing him. And when Peter had realized what he had done, his heart condemned him. Maybe he thought, well, <laughs> Jesus would never want to see him again. I've sinned so bad. I've done such a rotten thing that, that he'll, he'll, he'll just turn his back on me and, and never want to have anything to do with me again. But see... On Resurrection Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb. They were going to uh, anoint uh, the body of Jesus. And when they got there, they noticed that that stone had been rolled away. And the tomb, they looked inside looking for Jesus, and the tomb was empty. He wasn't there. You know what they, you know what they found? They found an angel. An angel that was, that was uh, sitting there, and, and he told them this. He says, he's not here. He's not here. He's arisen. And then in, in Mark chapter 16, verse 7, the angel said to them, but go. Go tell his disciples, and Peter too. That he is going before you into Galilee. 
There you will see him as he said to you. You notice the only disciple they, they, they called out by name was Peter. Because you know what? Jesus knew that Peter had failed him big time. He also knew that Peter was broken hearted because of his sin. He knew Peter's heart as he knows our hearts because he knows all things. That's what John tells us in, in, in verse 20. And he knows all things. God knows. So he wanted Peter to know that he still loved him and had a purpose for his life. Just as God said in, in Jeremiah, in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, he says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. I could hear those words just ringing in Peter. I know my thoughts towards you. It's not thoughts of condemnation. Thoughts of to give you hope, to give you a future. And, the, and, and, and listen, God knows that we sometimes fail him. But he wants to assure us that he loves us. And he wants to remind us that, that he still has a purpose for our lives. You know, there are times in our lives when we really shouldn't trust our feelings. Sometimes I don't feel like a dead. But that doesn't mean I'm not a dead. Sometimes I don't feel like I'm married. But that doesn't mean I'm not married. Listen, when you don't feel like a Christian, remember those caring acts of love that, that, was, that, that, the, that the Holy Spirit prompted you to do? Remember those. I do that sometimes. And, and there, there's been times, and I'm sure there's, there's been times when, when this has happened to you. I, I sit in a restaurant not too long ago and I decided, I mean, I just sit there and, and there was some ladies that were having breakfast. I knew one of them. Uh, and, and I was sitting in a booth a little ways from them. And I just felt a prompting from the Holy Spirit. And I told the waitress, I says, do me a favor and give me their, their ticket and I'll pay for it. And so she did, and I, I, know, I sit back there, and, and I notice that they, they were looking at her kind of strange, and they said, we're waiting for our bill. And she says, oh, no, no, somebody else has already paid for you. You should have seen the look on their, their face like, wow. And so I got up and went to pay my bill, and she says, oh, there's no bill. She says, those ladies paid for yours. And not only that, they refused to allow you to pay for theirs. <laughs> and I said, wow, double whammy. <laughs> and there's been times like that when, when I've been sitting in a restaurant and somebody has come up. In fact, the first time, it happened to me one time and it just, just floored me. I was in uh, Grand Rapids when I went there last year for, for our two Indian, our two girls there that went to college. And I'm sitting in this Indian restaurant and this this gentleman walks up to me and he says, do you mind if I pay for your bill? I went, duh. <laughs> Remember those times when you have reached out and done something for someone else? They didn't ask for it, but you just did it. You felt, you felt prompted to do that. Remember those, those caring acts of love that you've done. That's the assurance number one. And, and that will, will, cause, will, will, 
will cause you to enjoy assurance number two. Assurance number two is this. Prayers answered. Prayers answered. When we, when we assure our hearts that we abide in Christ and he abides in us by, by remembering our considerate or caring, compassionate acts of love, then our hearts will condemn us no longer. And the result will be, as John tells us in verse 21, Beloved, if our, hearts, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence. Toward God. See, having confidence means that, that we have the freedom, we have the, the openness of speech. See, if we allow our hearts to condemn us, then we're going to feel guilty. We're going to feel unworthy to even pray. Have you ever, have you ever felt that some, some morning? You just didn't feel like praying. Something wasn't right. But when we don't let our hearts condemn us, then we can, we can approach God with confidence. We can approach God with boldness. You know, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That doesn't mean that we're, that we're self-righteous. It does mean this, that we are confident and, and we have a, a certainty of our standing before Almighty God. And that He allows us to have the assurance that according to 1 John 3, 22, whatever we ask, we receive from Him because we keep His commandments and do the things that are pleasing in His sight. That, that first part is a first part of that verse is a great promise from God. It says, "Whatever we ask, we receive of him." But let, listen, let's not jump too far in that promise. You see, every promise in the Bible has a premise. For every promise, there's a premise. Every promise that is given in God's word is conditional. So this promise is only valid if two things from God's word are governing our lives. And the two things are this. Number one is precepts. Precepts, number two is principles. The first thing John says is that we keep his commandments. That's what precepts are. Precepts are commands. They're, they're written orders that apply to certain areas of our lives. The Bible says in, in Psalm 119, verse 4, you have commanded us to keep your precepts diligently. A precept is a clear command. Here's an example. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And then there's another one in, in uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Let no corrupt, that is no un, uh, unwholesome or, or no filthy word. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. Those are precepts. They're, they're clear commands that is given to us in God's word. Secondly, John says in verse 22, and do these things that are pleasing in his sight. That refers to principles. A, a principle is is a basic truth that can be applied to many areas of our lives. For example, that there's, there's not a command or a precept, if you will, in God's Word that says, uh, you shall not use methamphetamine or cocaine. I can't find it anywhere in the Bible. These, these are addictive drugs, right? 
But there is a principle that applies to many areas of our lives that would forbid it. Listen to what Paul says in the last part of of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. Paul says, listen, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. It is absolutely wrong for us to allow anything to control us or to bring us under its power except for the Holy Spirit. The reason is that God desires us to be filled with and controlled by His Holy Spirit exclusively. And we're told in... uh, In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, Ephesians 5, 18, the Apostle Paul says this, And do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation. That word dissipation, in in the Greek it means a, a, a descent into drunkenness. Do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. If you're filled with the Holy Spirit, what's going to happen? You're going to walk in the Spirit. The Bible says you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And you will display the fruit of the Spirit, of which the first component of the fruit of the Spirit is love. Love. Having your prayers answered is dependent upon keeping God's precepts and principles. Jesus made that clear in in John chapter 15, verse 7, when he said this, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. There's also one other premise to that promise that's not listed here, but but there's a, there's, a, there's a premise to the promise of answered prayer, and it's found in 1 John chapter 5. Later on, John points this out in 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 to 15. He says, Now this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked for. You see, when you're abiding in Christ, and when His words are abiding in you, then you'll you'll obey both His precepts and principles of His word, and then you'll be praying according to His will. You know, I've got a lot of wills. <laughs> and, and, and sometimes, you know, I'm praying for, for, for someone who is who's dying of cancer. And I'm praying, God, heal them. That's my, that, that's my will. That's my desires for them to be healed. But I always have to remember that key word, nevertheless. Nevertheless, not my will, Lord, but yours be done. Because I'll guarantee you this, that prayer will be answered. He will be healed, if not in this life, in the next life. Because see, when we die and go to heaven, we're we're totally healed. We have perfect bodies. We don't suffer those headaches anymore. We don't have that cancer anymore. We We don't use those walkers anymore or wheelchairs or... Uh, We don't have that emphysema and lung problems anymore. We have a glorified body that God has given us. And we're healed. We're healed. I like the the testimony of one gentleman as I uh, went and and prayed for his wife who had cancer. And, And that was my prayer. God, you know, bring her healing. Bring healing into her life. And... She passed away later on. 
But you know what her husband told me? He says, God healed her. She's got a perfect body now. She's totally healed. We need to be praying the will of God. John continues in verse 23 by adding this truth. And this is his commandment. That we should believe on the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another. As he has given us commandment. I mean having faith in Jesus Christ, that is, becoming a genuine believer and loving one another are, are inseparable. They cannot be separated. We must love one another. That's the whole, I, I believe, the whole focus on, on what John is telling us through in this letter. You want to be a contagious Christian, here's how to be a contagious Christian. You've got to love one another. You can't be harboring that seed of bitterness in your life. Because, see, when there is a seed of bitterness, it's just like any other seed. If I go out in, 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 in my lawn, if I plant grass seed, guess what's going to come up? Grass. And every once in a while, the weed seed gets there. And weeds come up. So I would rather, in my life, plant beautiful grass seed than weed seed. Because whatever you plant, the Bible says, whatever you sow, that you shall also reap. That's what's going to grow. And if, you're, if you've got that seed of bitterness in your heart, guess what's going to grow? Anger. More bitterness. Malice. Wrath. Which can lead to even more serious things. Assurance number three is this, a powerful presence. I love this one, a powerful presence. Faithfully obeying God's precepts and principles will cause us to feel the power of his presence in our lives. Here's how John states it in verse 24. Now, he who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. By this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. See, every time we are obedient to God's precepts, to his commands, especially through those acts of of, uh, 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 carrying acts of love, we will feel God's presence and approval in our hearts. Think of the last time you, you, you did something really good for someone. Now, not only did they feel good about it, but how did you feel? Didn't you feel good about that? I did, I did something good for someone. The, the, late, the late Tommy Higgle calls it a spiritual impression. And words cannot adequately describe it. When in in some difficult, difficult circumstance, we obey God's commands, we can sense his approval. It's it's almost like like hearing the, the Holy Spirit shouting at us, way to go! You're behaving like a child of God. It's like getting that at a boy or at a girl from God himself. It's one way we experience the truth that Paul talks about in in Romans chapter 8, verse 16. In Romans 8, 16, he says this. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we're the children of God. I mean, when we perform carrying acts of love, when we're obedient to to God's precepts and and His principles, we can sense an inward confirmation that we are truly God's children. 
And we can feel like we're a Christian. We can feel like we're a child of God. You know, at times in your life when you feel like a, when you don't feel like a Christian, and there'll be times in, in our lives when that happens. When you don't feel like Christians, think about what we talked about today. And remember Assurance 1, uh, the, 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 the caring, compassionate acts of love that you've done towards someone else. And remember Assurance number 2, those, those answered prayers. Go back and think about prayers that you prayed about, and God just really answered those prayers and, and are, just sometimes in a surprising way to me. See, God never, he, he doesn't always answer the prayers the way we think they ought to be answered. He doesn't always answer the prayers in the timing we think they ought to be. But he does in his own timing. And for a reason and for a purpose. And, and then remember that assurance number three. God's powerful presence in your life. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Father, thank you again for, for the, the great teachings of the Apostle John. And Father, as we go through this life, there, there are times when we don't feel like we're Christians. We don't feel, sometimes we don't feel worthy to be called your child. But your word is so very clear that when we come to you in faith, believing with our hearts, Jesus Christ, your Son, and confessing him with our mouths, that you give us eternal life, that you adopt us into your family, and we become your children. Behold what manner of love it is that you bestowed upon us. That we should be called your children. Help us to always remember that, Lord. Bring to, to remembrance those, those caring acts of love that we've done to others in the past. And... and, and Father, that uh, the, those, those answered prayers that, that we've received from you. And, and also, Father, the presence of you in our lives as we feel your presence there. Thank you. Thank you, Father, for it all. Help us to become more contagious with our Christianity and our faith that we would spread it around, Lord. Especially now, it's so, so needed in this, this dark world that we live in. Let it be spread to others. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together as we sing our doxology. See you next week.